spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil olive, beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually in the tabernacle of the congregation, and it shall be a statute forever in your generations. The Eternal Light. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations present Chapter 15 of The Eternal Light. This public service program is prepared under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Today's story, written by Morton Wishingrad, features Edwin Jerome as Solomon Schechter and Sarah Burton as Matilda, his wife. Following the dramatic portion of the program, you will hear a talk by Dr. Jacob Cohn. His eyes were quite blue, and his beard was quite red. He had a most unrabbinical temper, and when he swore, which was quite frequent, it was li like a catalogue of biblical prophets. He was terribly untidy. He used his vest for an ashtray, and the house was a chaos of manuscripts and books. It was 1890, and he was lecturer in rabbinics at Cambridge University in England. His name was Solomon Schechter, and I was his wife. There was something about Schechter irresistible to men of learning. Our house was rich in friendships. Israel Zangwill, the writer, Father Nolan, who came to argue the apostles against the rabbis, Professor Haddon, the anthropologist, James Fraser, the author of The Golden Bough, the Reverend Charles Taylor, master of St. John's College. Schechter quarreled with, with them by turns and taught them by turns and warmed them constantly with his wit and affection. We were very poor, but the Cambridge Library was filled with books, and we felt no lack. Once I recollect a student came to see Schechter to say goodbye. What is this nonsense about goodbye, Matthews? You haven't completed your studies. I can't afford to stay on, Dr. Schechter. Oh, that's absurd. We can't afford to lose you. Thank you, sir. How much do you need? Please, sir, I, I didn't come for that. How much do you need, Matthews? I can't accept your help. It's not my help at all. I have charge of a college fund for students who need assistance. You have, Dr. Schechter? How much do you need? Are you sure, sir? Will 50? pounds be enough. Thank you, Dr. Schechter. I don't know what to say. Just forget this nonsense about leaving. Tilda? Yes? Uh, please give Mr. Matthews 50 pounds. 50 pounds? Of course. Now, if you will both excuse me, there is some work I have to do. See you in class, Matthews. Come now, Tilda. You don't have to look so anxious. It was only 50 pounds. It was nearly all we had. Why did you do it, Solomon? That boy is a fine scholar. He's going to be a fine minister someday. Why didn't you refer him to the Episcopal Church Fund? But Matthews is proud. He would not take charity. It wouldn't be charity. He could pay it back once they found him a pulpit. Oh, well, let's not talk about it, Tilda. I don't understand it. You're the only Jew on the faculty. It would be different if you were rich. Tilda, no man has a right to more than bread and water and fuel for his soul as long as the poor are not provided with the necessaries of life. But this wasn't a necessity at all. It was for bread. It was not for bread. It was for tuition. Learning is the necessity of life, Tilda. Now stop fretting. It's, it's unbecoming. Schechter needed a new greatcoat. That winter and the next, he had to wear his old one. When I complained, he bristled. 
Matilda, I'm a scholar. You cannot be everything if you want to be anything. I knew he was right, but he did need a new coat. Shafter wasn't a saint. He detested what he called mental squinting. He loved Matthews, who was a Christian, because Matthews was an honest scholar. Once, a would-be scholar bored him for two whole days until he couldn't stand it any longer. Sir, the vocal organs were not meant to cover up ignorance. But, but, Dr. Schefter, Maimonides said... Uh, excuse me, sir. You know as much about Maimonides as a monkey in a cage knows about evolution. <sighs> now, must you stay? But I wanted you to discuss this passage in Nietzsche. Uh, you will do very well. It does not require deep thinking to misunderstand Nietzsche. Your hat, sir. Why, I'm afraid, Dr. Schefter, you don't appreciate my scholarship. On the contrary, my dear sir. You have the encyclopedic ignorance of the highly uneducated. Oh. The door, sir. I have <laughs> an important been. paper to write. Please excuse me and try. Try not to fall down the stairs. I made him send a note of apology. We argued about it for a whole day. He grumbled like a bear and began his note. Sir, my wife informs me I have been a boor. I beg my pardon. That won't do. No? Schechter, you apologize decently. All right. Sir, it has been my observation that one must love people very much in order not to hate them. Schechter. Uh, what's the matter, Tilda? Solomon Schechter, you're the most exasperating, the most prejudiced man I, I have ever married. Tilda, a man cannot carry on the business of life without prejudices. My prejudice is that I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God. You've offended that man. Yes, I tried to for two days, but it seemed to make no impression. He's probably so heartsick now he won't be able to eat for a week. Oh, oh no, Tilda. He is a very holy man, full of misquoted scriptures. But I think he has still got room for a good dinner, which he will eat with great devotion. Solomon Schechter, are you or are you not going to send that man a civil note of apology? Uh, but it might encourage him to be a rabbi. Think what a horrible example of red tape Judaism he would be. Solomon Schechter. All right, my dear. Uh, hand me the Bible. What do you want the Bible for? I, uh, I want to verify the passage that begins, I am looking for my father's asses. Oh, you're hopeless, Schechter. I throw up my hand. Oh, do you, Tilda? I emphatically do. Well, in that case, give me another sheet of paper. I will send the note of apology. That was very characteristic of Solomon Schechter. The only grievances he ever nursed were those against himself. And while Cambridge and London knew and admired him as the foremost Talmudical authority in the West, I knew him and loved him as a very shy human man who was intoxicated with God. From all over the world, scholars sent precious manuscripts to Cambridge, ancient manuscripts in Hebrew, in Aramaic, in Coptic, and Schefter studied them under his glass and wrote his opinions. Once, I recall, he uttered his credo to Dr. Taylor and to Father Nolan. Every discovery of an ancient document giving evidence of a bygone world, if undertaken in the right spirit, that is for the honor of God and the truth, is an act of resurrection in miniature. Schechter believed that the Jewish ministry must be concerned with Jewish scholarship, and nothing distressed him more than what he called platform Judaism. Many congregations offered him rabbinical posts, but he preferred to remain at Cambridge, living precariously on the meager pay of a lecturer. He published his studies of the Talmud, and to a small group throughout the world, he was a famous man. Now a larger group was to hear of him. It began in May, 1896. Two of our dearest friends, Margaret Gibson and Agnes Lewis, had just returned from the Near East. Now, Agnes Lewis, 
held two ancient fragments of Hebrew manuscript out to him. Mrs. Lewis. Mrs. Lewis, where, where did you find this? Margaret and I bought them from a book dealer in Jerusalem. Uh, please, handle it very carefully. What is it? Uh, this one, this is a fragment of the ancient Jerusalem Talmud. But it is this one. This scrap of paper? Yes, Mrs. Lewis. This scrap of paper. Listen, I will translate. The wise man will seek out the wisdom of all the ancients and will be occupied in prophecies. He will serve among great men and appear before him that ruleth. He will travel through the land of strange nations. Uh, but that is all I can make out. But it is enough. Well, Dr. Schechter, you seem very agitated. Mrs. Lewis, this is a fragment from the Hebrew book of Ben Sira, the book Ecclesiasticus of the Apocrypha. Is it very important? The only original is in existence is the Greek translation. Now, Mrs. Lewis, the Hebrew original has been missing for a thousand years, more than a thousand years. So you're sure this is from it? As sure as there is a God in Israel. And I think I know where this came from. There can be only one place. Jerusalem? No. No, not Jerusalem. The writings were destroyed by Titus in 70 A.D. The place... The place must be the Geniza of Cairo. Geniza, Dr. Shepard? Uh, yes, Mrs. Lewis. Geniza. The Geniza is a hiding place for old books and manuscripts. Among the Jews, holy books are never destroyed. When they are torn or worn out, they are buried in the ground or hidden away. And we know there is a Geniza in Cairo. There can be no other place, Mrs. Lewis. But, Dr. Schechter, if this book is as old as you say, it would have decomposed no, by now. Not in the dry Egyptian air. Mrs. Lewis, I must get the rest of Ecclesiasticus. I absolutely must. Schechter didn't sleep that night. He was agitated, abstracted. And he immediately reported Mrs. Lewis's discovery to the Reverend Dr. Taylor, Master of St. John's College. I... I must go to Cairo, Dr. Taylor. How do you know you'll find anything, Dr. Schechter? I don't know. But if my assumption is correct, there is a treasure of hidden manuscripts in Cairo. Well, I'm sure the university will grant you a leave. I have... I have no funds, sir. If you do, Schechter, you have all the funds I have. I knew you would say that, Dr. Taylor. That is why I came to you. I'll talk to Professor McAllister and Professor Sidgwick. They'll supply what I don't have. Thank you, sir. But I implore you. Yes? We must keep this absolutely secret. Every unscrupulous book dealer and collector in the Orient will be following me. For them, this represents more wealth than the pyramids of the pharaohs. We must find the manuscripts and preserve them for science. was as good as his word. For many years it had been known that somewhere in Egypt there was a careful campaign of pilfering from some secret storehouse, and Schechter was staking his reputation on the fact that the storehouse was in Cairo. Taylor found the money, Schechter bid us all a hurried goodbye and sailed to Egypt. Schechter laid his groundwork carefully. The first man he saw was the chief rabbi. Dear Tilda, I burn with impatience. But I must win the chief rabbi to my side. I flirt with him by the hour and am taking Arabic lessons three times a week. You see how practical your old man is. His letters came every day reporting slow progress. The rabbi is very kind to me. He took me to the Cairo Synagogue, where I suspect the Geniza is located. I am afraid I nearly disgraced you. My foot caught against the cobblestone, and I uttered an Anglo-Saxon monosyllable which begins with D and ends with M. Did you say something, Dr. Schechter? Oh, uh, no, no, nothing at all, Rabbi, nothing at all. I thought I heard you say something in English. Uh, just a little word, Rabbi. Well, you must explain its meaning then, Dr. Schechter. Well, Rabbi... We have a word in the English language, a, a little word of one syllable, which is full of theological meaning and is used as a, as a sort of charm against things that annoy us. Oh, is that all? 
I thought for a moment you were swearing. Merely theologically, my dear Rabbi. I see. Well, Dr. Schechter, this is the Cairo Synagogue. Ah. I know every room here. I'm afraid you've come for nothing. Do you mind if I make my own inspection? Not at all, Dr. Schechter. I've asked the Beatle to assist you. I hope you find what you're looking for, but, Dr. Schechter, I strongly doubt that it's here. Uh, this wall is hollow. Oh, no, it can't be. Uh, well, listen. Uh, definitely it's hollow. Nothing of the sort, Dr. Schechter. Oh, please come this way. We'll try the face. Oh, uh, yes, you. Uh, I believe I don't know your name, sir. That's all right. I have some advice to give you. Well, that's very kind of you. What advice, sir? Return to England. I have no intention of returning. That's very unfortunate. The climate of Egypt can be rather unwholesome for foreigners. Oh, I see. I've taken the liberty to book passage for you. A few of my friends have gotten up a purse to give you. Your friends are extremely generous. It's merely uh, public spirited. Thank you again, sir, but if you don't mind, I rather like Cairo. Well, that's a question. Dr. Schefter likes Cairo. The question is, though, does Cairo like Dr. Schefter? <laughs> That's the man, Rabbi. Oh, I know him. He's a speculator in rare books. Do you still believe that I have come on a wild goose chase? I'm beginning to change my mind. Dr. Schechter. Yes, Rabbi. Only the beetle and I know that you're looking for a secret hoard of manuscripts. Uh, excuse me, Rabbi. Only you, the beetle, and the book dealer. That's my point. I didn't tell the book dealer. If you don't mind, Rabbi, I think I should like to pay a visit to our friend, the beetle. That doesn't sound hollow to you, does it, Beetle? No, Dr. Schechter, it doesn't. Uh, listen again, Beetle. That doesn't sound hollow. I can't say it does. Get me a pickaxe. I'm going to find out. Now, don't be stubborn, Dr. Schechter. Hmm. Well, that is what the book dealers think, is it not? Yes. That's what they think. That's what I think. Why don't you help me save the synagogue from desecration? I don't want to break the wall. How do you get in? The way you'll get into Gehenna. I'm sorry you will not help me, Beetle, but that doesn't matter. I'll manage myself somehow. The synagogue at Cairo employed a new Beetle the next day. Schechter wrote me about it, and I cabled him to be careful. He was careful. Yips, yips, yips. Kitty, 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 kitty. Come, 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 come. It's a nice bowl of milk. Oh, 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 oh. Not so fast. It may give you indigestion. <laughs> oh, oh. Rabbi, Rabbi, quick. Animated, quick. Rabbi, your cat has been frozen. It's all dead, Dr. Sector. I think she's all cleaned out. I have seen for a veterinary, Rabbi. I'm afraid you nearly had a dead kitten. And a dead scholar. Apparently, the Egyptian climate does disagree with foreigners. What are you going to do, Dr. Sector? Shall we have the book dealer arrested? No, no. There is nothing we can prove. There is only one way to stop him. Just tell me. I'll take the necessary steps. I'll have to take the steps. Rabbi, I will trouble you for a pickaxe. <laughs> It's a room. More than a room, Rabbi. Careful of the masonry. See? A hole in the ceiling and the ladder. <coughs> That's how they got in. <coughs> Can you see through the dust, Dr. Sector? I don't have to see, Rabbi. No? No. I know. This is the secret Geniza of Cairo. The built-over part of the ancient synagogue. Rabbi... Here is our treasure chest, the Geniza of Cairo. (laughs) 
I could barely decipher his writing now, for the penmanship was worse than usual. It was feverish. And I knew that Solomon Schechter had made a great discovery. Mrs. Taylor and Mrs. Lewis had a cable from him, and our hearts and hopes were with Schechter in the airless, windowless Geniza of Cairo. Schechter! <coughs> Where are you, Schechter? <coughs> Name of God, man, you can't remain here day and night. It's stifling. Look at this thermometer, Schechter. 110 degrees. Only 110 degrees, Rabbi. <coughs> but 100,000 precious manuscripts, Rabbi. 100,000 lost manuscripts of an ancient Hebrew civilization. <coughs> Read on, Mrs. Schechter. Ragged scraps of writing to make the hearts of European scholars glad. For centuries, whitewash had tumbled upon them from walls and ceilings. The sand of the desert has lodged in their folds and wrinkles. Water has drenched them. They have squeezed and hurt each other whilst all the time some of them were keeping for us very precious secrets. Give Dr. Taylor my great and abiding affection. As soon as I know what I have, I am bringing my treasure back to Cambridge. Praise be to God. Is that the end? Yes, that's the end of the letter. But it's a beginning. A new beginning for Hebrew scholarship. Solomon Schechter returned with his manuscripts. He returned one of the great discoveries in modern times. But he returned an old man. His eyes were filmed. His beard was fringed with white. Days and nights in an airless room under the blazing Egyptian sun had taken their toll. His lungs were thick with the dust and residue of centuries. He had burrowed like a mole, breathing it in hour after hour, day after day. And he knew that he had shortened a useful life by many years. But Solomon Schechter did not grieve. He was supremely happy. Tilda. Yes? Will you ask Dr. Taylor if he can stop by? I think I am well enough to see him. All right. I'll send Dr. Taylor a note. You are happy, Tilda, are you not? I rejoice to have you back. Tilda. Whatever is in your mind, understand one thing. Yes. There is a rabbinical injunction. Every age must make its own contribution to the temple of truth. All right. If it does not make its contribution, Tilda, it must consider itself false to truth and to learning. Tilda. Yes. I, I thank God he has given me strength to make my contribution. Please rest. Please. I'll send for Dr. Taylor. I know there is no need to thank you again. The manuscripts speak for me, Taylor. I understand. What will you do with them, Schechter? The decision is yours. I have already made up my mind. Schechter, you don't... You don't mean that you're going to sell them. Oh, I apologize. I have no right to tell a man in your financial position what to do. How many millions of pounds do you think they are worth? It's a very great fortune, Schechter. That's all I can say. Well, that makes me supremely happy. Take it, Dr. Taylor. The manuscripts belong to Cambridge University. You know what you're doing? Yes. Dr. Taylor, I was born in Romania. When I was a little boy and came from Cheva, my body was covered with blood and with bruises. You see, I was a Jew. Then I went to Austria. I found the higher anti-Semitism that does not bruise the flesh, but lacerates the soul. In England, in England, I found happiness. A place to work. If you don't mind, Dr. Taylor, I want these manuscripts for Cambridge University and for England. He was 
a man like a lion, and he recovered. But now he was an aged lion. His beard was white, but his eyes were still blue. And when his tongue grew caustic, I knew that whatever had been taken from his life in years, nothing had been taken from his mind. We found much happiness in Cambridge, and when the call came from America, Solomon Schechter and I went to New York, where he became the second president of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. England and America, they were the countries he loved. And I, Matilda Schechter, I love them also with all my soul. <laughs> Copies of the script you have just heard, together with a talk which follows immediately, may be obtained free of cost by writing to The Eternal Light, 3080 Broadway, New York 27, New York. And now we present Dr. Jacob Cohn of Temple Sinai in Los Angeles, who will speak to you from Los Angeles. Who were privileged to sit at the feet of Dr. Schechter... <clears throat> will always treasure the memory of a friend and a great teacher. His greatness consisted not only in the depth and breadth of his learning, but in that personal vitality and intuitive insight which illumined every subject he touched and continually opened up to us new vistas of religious thought and experience. Though his scholarship embraced every field of Jewish learning, he was himself most deeply interested and wrote most felicitously and warmly of the personalities which that tradition produced and on which it fed. To him, life under the law and in the atmosphere of Jewish observance found its supreme vindication in the fact that it answered the spiritual needs of a wide variety of human types. He gloried in the fact that prophets and sages, mystics and rationalists, sophisticated scholars and simple pietists found nourishment therein for their souls and fertilized it continually with the rich deposits of their own personal lives. But he drew not only on Jewish sources, St. Francis, whom he compared with Judah the pious, Abraham Lincoln in the mood of Gettysburg and the second inaugural, the holy man of India called from Kipling's novel Kim, which he hailed as a contribution to the understanding of the East by the West. All of these were to our delight interwoven with one another in his exposition of the inner life of the Jewish characters with whom he was dealing. He found the universality of the religious experience not in some common denominator of dogma or practice that ran through all the historic faiths, but rather in a kinship of great souls. Religion to him was a great force in the culture of the world because it created a communion of great spirits in all faiths and lands. Thank you, Dr. Jacob Cohen. The Eternal Light was prepared by the Jewish Theological Seminary of America and came to you from New York City. This is the National Broadcasting Company.